so uh, this, right, is you'll see that there's a particular structure, right, and it's going to be surrounded by a kind of connective tissue sheath, right, but what is it actually made of, okay? So what is the uh, particular structure made out of? So if I have muscle, like an actual muscle that you can dissect out, right, that you are dissecting out, it's surrounded by what's called epimyceum, right? That's a connective tissue sheath. What is the muscle itself made out of? Okay, so bundles, right? Do you know the other name for it? Bundles? So it's muscle what? Whoops, hold on. Muscle, really? Right, right. Why are you not writing? You're killing me. Hold on. All right, so let's see if the stupid PowerPoint version works. All right, please write. name for a bundle? What is it? <laughs> Other name for a bundle? Fascicle. So this is fascicles. And fascicles are surrounded by perimyceum. And then within that perimyceum you have what? What are they? Muscle fibers. What's the other way of referring to muscle fibers? Muscle cells. Muscle cells. So if they're muscle cells, then they are myocytes. Because that's how you say muscle cell, myocytes. So over here, we have myocytes, which are surrounded with an endomycium. And then within the endomycium, what do we have? A whole bunch of what? Myo what? Fibros? Mm -hmm. And then the myofibrils, are they surrounded by connective tissue? 
Why not? What was this above myofibril? What does it say? Myofibril. Says what? Myofibril. Cells, right? So do you have connective tissue, right, inside of a muscle cell? No. You can have, right, proteins and things like that, right, making up like the cytoskeleton, but you do not have connective tissue. From this point on, no more connective tissue sheet. So we're going to skip that, and then what is a myofibril made out of? Sorry, it's right there. Sarcomere. <laughs> and then the sarcomere, what is it made out of? Cells? <laughs> filaments. Myo filaments. And then those filaments are basically just made up of proteins. Okay, so you'll have like myosin and uh, you know actin kind of proteins, right? Okay, so those are the proteins that are going to make all this stuff up. So if we want to actually see that, right, then what you should do is look at this illustration because this is the exact same thing we just talked about, but it's a graphic representation of it. So you'll notice that there's actually going to be an epimysium which is surrounding this. Right? And that's essentially right, what we're seeing on the outside right there. That's the epimysium. And then within that, you're actually going to see a fascicle and a fascicle and a fascicle. Right? And then basically, those fascicles, right, like this, surrounded by perimysium. So here's the perimysium around the fascicle. Within the fascicle, you're going to see a muscle fiber, which you can also call a myocyte or a muscle cell, like this. And then that's going to be surrounded by an endomycium, just like this, endomycium. And then you'll notice that the muscle cell inside of it has all these tiny little tubes or cylinders, and these are your myofibrils that you're seeing inside of there. Okay, so those are all little myofibrils making this up. Each one of those little red dots is a myofibril. And this is inside of a cell, right? That's one muscle cell. Now, once you kind of get the sense of that, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the tinier stuff. We're actually not even going to focus on the large scale muscle. We're going to go all the way down to the microscopic and then do the little things, right? Now, uh, what we want to understand is, well, what is muscle good for, right? So some of the things that muscle can actually do, well, we know that it's actually going to contract and the contraction gives you some movement, but contraction also gives you stability. Like if you are balancing, you actually have to contract muscles to balance. And that's going to be for your somatopleur, your conscious control skeleton. The other thing that muscle does, not skeletal muscle, but smooth muscle, is its movement of your splanchnopleur, your guts, your stomach, your intestines. You move uh, food through there. That's smooth muscle of your splanchnopleur. Something else you can do if you've ever been really cold and you shiver, you can actually generate heat. Okay? And so the, essentially, right, the kind of resistance is actually building up and releasing heat. So you have thermogenesis. Uh, right now, that you, the fact that you are actually ventilating your lungs and you breathe in and breathe out, that's due to muscular contraction. And so you're actually pressurizing your coelom, right? So you're increasing the pressure, decreasing the pressure. That's what you're doing with your muscles. Uh, of course, cardiac muscle, you're going to have a heartbeat. And smooth muscle is responsible for right, the walls of your blood vessels. So what they're doing is giving it structural integrity, allowing it to withstand the pressures that are put on it. And it's also evening out the pressure because your heart pumps one huge volume of blood out and it's not like your pressure in your arteries goes up and then straight down again the way it does in your heart your heart has massive pressure and then once it ejects the blood then the pressure drops precipitously that's not what happens in your blood vessels your blood vessels the muscle inside slowly contracts and releases the pressure so it's actually a kind of slower curve or grade releasing the pressure for your blood vessels. And then the last thing, communication. You can communicate with facial muscles. You can also communicate with your other, right, skeletal muscles. Like if you looked at somebody and you were like this, what does this mean? <coughs> yeah, it means come here. That's communication. That's what muscle can do, right? Now, 
If we're actually looking skeletal muscle, it's defined by the striations. So we refer to it as striated muscle. Now, cardiac muscle is also striated, right? But we tend to refer to skeletal muscle uh, as the striated kind, even though uh, cardiac is also striated. Now, the striations are not these. These are not, like, these are actually the muscle cells that you see going across like that. So perpendicular to those muscle cells, that's where we're actually going to have the striations, okay? So what we see is the striations are these coming perpendicular like this. These are the striations. Now, on an actual like histologic section, uh, you have to see it a kind of a certain way, but you can see that there are actually striations going up and down like this. And these are perpendicular to the muscle cell itself, okay? The other thing you should notice is this muscle cell, right, has a nucleus and a nucleus, and it'll probably have another one and another one and another one. So these ones are actually multinucleate, right, multinucleate. Now, the proteins that are actually making up these striations are actin and myosin. Okay, these are the proteins that are making up these striations, okay? Now, when we look, what we're going to see is the way that this works is in order to have the muscle cell contract, you're going to have a neuron, and it's going to have a motor neuron with a cell body right here. So here's the cell body. It's going to have its axon coming all the way down, and it's going to go to what's referred to as the neuromuscular junction. Neuromuscular junction is the same thing as a synapse, except instead of neuron to neuron, it's neuron to muscle, and that's the neuromuscular junction. Now, if we focus and we get uh, kind of zoomed into the neuromuscular junction, right? then you're gonna see that there's a gap there, just like the synapse. And you're gonna have synaptic vesicles, just like this, and like this, and like this. And those red little things that are illustrated right there, those are neurotransmitters. And conveniently, it's acetylcholine, just like the one we studied when we did the neurons. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that we're gonna use to actually cause the muscle to contract. So, same thing as a neuron. Your action potential comes down Right, goes all the way down the axon to the telodendria. You now have an influx of calcium, which causes the synaptic vesicles to bond to, or bind to the plasma membrane. You release the acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. It crosses the neuromuscular junction, binds to its receptor on the muscle plasma membrane. Now, remember what we called the uh, uh, plasma membrane for the axon? What did we call it? Axolemma. So, do you have any idea what we're going to call the plasma membrane for the muscle? Myolemma. Myolemma would actually make sense. However, right, because it's never good enough to only use one dead language, uh, we're actually going to use sarco, because sarco means flesh. So it's the sarcolemma. Myolemma, I know, that would make sense, but it's sarcolemma, okay? So the receptors are on the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, and just like a neuron, just like a postsynaptic neuron, this opens up chemically gated channels, which then increases the permeability, which then generates the flow of ions, or I should say allows the flow of ions to now generate an electrical signal on the sarcolemma. So just like a neuron, the muscle can actually generate and propagate an action potential. And that action potential is going to travel along the sarcolemma. Now, where's it going to go? So it travels along the muscle cell. And this right here, this is a muscle cell. That's basically like a section of a muscle cell. How do you know that that's one whole muscle cell? What's this? And that. And that. And that. What are those? Those are nuclei. So if you can see those nuclei right there, which they tend to be on the outer surface of the, the muscle cell, then you know, oh, well, that's one whole muscle cell, okay? And then what you see sticking out, like kind of like this, emerging like that, what's that? What's that little cylinder coming out? That's a myofibril. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in. So you can actually see there's like a little rectangle right there. That's to show you that we're zooming in right here, right? So what is this stuff right here? What's this right here? What is all that? That's the sarcolemma, because that's the cell membrane right here. This is the plasma membrane. That's the sarcolemma that you see right there, okay? So now,
what we're going to see is this myofibril, right, right here, is kind of sticking out, but when you don't look at the one that's sticking out and you look at the ones that are not kind of emerging, you'll notice that there's a myofibril right here, and there's a myofibril right there, and there's a one up, up top, right? And the myofibrils are surrounded by this blue stuff right here, right? So the one that's marked number two, right? And there's a reason why it's marked number two. What is that blue stuff? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. If you want, you can just say SR, sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? And what you should notice is the sarcoplasmic reticulum is wrapped around the myofibril. What's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Calcium. Calcium is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, you should also notice that there is a series of these funny little tubes coming from the surface of the sarcolemma, extending deep into the muscle cell, and then they're actually also wrapping around the myofibril. But they're only wrapping around the myofibril in very particular locations. Okay? So you'll notice that it comes down and it wraps around the myofibril right here. And what are these yellow things? Those are T-tubules. What's the T stand for? So this is my, my muscle cell, my cylinder. So if I slice through it like this, what kind of slice am I taking? Transverse. Those are transverse tubules. Okay. Now, what you should notice is those T-tubules come down and they actually interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is bracketing the T-tubules. So what's this part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called? What's that called? Those two parts that I circled on either side of the T-tubule. No, that is not a triad. It's part of a triad. The triad is the whole thing. T-tubule together with those two parts of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What's that part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called? That's a terminal cistern. You can say terminal cisternae, and that's plural. It's a terminal cistern. Okay? So there is one T-tubule, and there's one terminal cistern on one side, one terminal cistern on the other side. Together, how many structures is that? Three. That's a triad. Triad is two terminal cisternae with one T-tubule in between. And that's because what's going to happen is, now I'm going to erase all that stuff. And this is why we do one and two. Because what happens is, the action potential that was traveling the action potential that was traveling along the sarcolemma is going to reach a T-tubule. You should notice that the T-tubules are actually open. Okay? So this tube is an actual tube that allows the action potential to travel down the T-tubule to go into the muscle cell. So it carries the action potential down into the muscle cell until it gets to a triad. Now, once you reach the triad, then the action potential is going to affect the terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's how it works. So you're using the T-tubule to bring the action potential to the terminal cisterna so that you can now affect the terminal cisterna. And what was inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Calcium. Calcium. So what do you think is very concentrated inside of the terminal cistern? Calcium. That's exactly right. So now, right, we have to talk about, well, what is it that's so important about these myofibrils being surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum? And so what we have is the myofibrils are actually made of and you should see there's like a little line right here. There's a little line right there. Okay? So in between those two black lines that we see right there, that's one single structure. That's one unit for the muscle. And in fact, it's one unit for the myofibril. So the myofibrils are actually made of like a series of stacked units. Okay, it's basically like stacking cans. That's really what it's like. It's like you take one can and then you put another one and then another one and another one, right? And that's what they are. So what are those units that we see making up the myofibrils? That's a sarcomere, right? So that's one sarcomere. Now, that sarcomere is made up of what? 
Sure, proteins, right? But the pro whoa, what the heck just happened? Myofilaments? Yes. They're made up of myofilaments. And the myofilaments are what are made, are what are made up of proteins, right? So when we're actually looking at the filaments, you have two basic types. What are they? Thick and thin. So what kind is this? Thin. That's thin. What kind is this? Thin. That's a thick filament. The thin filament is actually made up of several different proteins. So if we zoom in on it, we can actually see that there is uh, a whole bunch of all these little balls that, right, that, that we kind of have right here, and they're twisting around each other. Okay? They're kind of twisting around in a helix. And those little globular proteins are the actin proteins. Okay? Now, what other proteins do we have here intertwined with the actin? What? What are the other proteins? Tropomyosin. Tropomyosin and? And troponin. Tropomyosin, right, is actually going to be this blue kind of braided thing kind of running across like that. That's the tropomyosin. The troponin is the smaller globular protein that we see on the tropomyosin. So there's the troponin, and it's actually two little globules, okay? So, whoops, so here's the troponin, here's the troponin, okay? So this is what makes up a thin filament. What is it that makes up your thick filament? Myosin. Myosin, so this is actually one myosin, whoa, what just happened? Stop. There, that's the myosin protein right there, right there. So, which part of the myosin protein is this? The that's the tail. And what part is this? That's the head. That's the head of the myosin protein. So now, what we're going to see is the myosin, the tails are actually stuck together and then kind of extending out like 360 degrees, extending out like this, you're going to have little myosin heads sticking out facing in all different directions. So all these little myosin heads are sticking out in all different directions. Uh, I actually am not concerned with Titan. Okay, Titan is not something that I'm concerned with. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you a question on it. Okay, the only reason why it's there is for passive, like if you passively stretch your muscle, right? Then the Titan allows your muscle to go back to its previous state. That's it, and I don't really care about it. Okay. Now, when we arrange these myofilaments, what you should notice is there's going to be uh, an attachment of your thick filaments to this line going up and down like this. So this big line that you see right there, what's that line? What is it? What's the line? That's the M line. Now, extending out from either direction, you're going to have a thick filament going like this. Extending out from either direction off of the M line. Okay. Now, M line, it's called the M line because it's in the middle of the sarcomere. Okay. Uh, now, it's, it's actually a German word, but it doesn't matter. It still means middle. Okay, so it's the middle line. Okay, that's where the uh, thick filaments are attached. Now, the other thing is the thin filaments. And the thin filaments are not attached to the M line. What are the thin filaments anchored to? They're anchored to the Z line. Okay, so this Z line right here, this also comes from a German word. And the German word just means in between. Okay? So it's this in-between disc or line that we're seeing right there. And the reason why it's in-between is, what is this whole structure right there? What's that entire structure that's bracketed between the two Z lines? That's one sarcomere. So if this is one sarcomere, then what's beginning right here? Another, Another sarcomere. So where is this line? In between them. And that's what the Z line is, is in between sarcomeres. Okay. Now, coming off of the Z line in both directions, there's going to be a thin filament and then a thin filament, a thin filament and then a thin filament. And so essentially what's going to end up happening is your thick and thin filaments are going to overlap each other. Right? So now when we look, the thick and thin filaments overlapping each other, this is a different illustration, right? Uh, but basically what you can see is here's a thin filament right here. And then here's a thick filament right here. And then this is your M line going straight up and down like that. 
Okay? So there's going to be, right, uh, a region, and the region that we're talking about is where you see all of those thick filaments. You see all those thick filaments, right? So what is that region where you see all the thick filaments called? That's the A-band, exactly. Now, when you don't have the thick filaments and you only have the thin filaments right here, what is that region called? That's the I-band. Now, when you have all these thick filaments, it's actually going to have light pass through it differently, okay? Then when you're at the I-band over here, that is the reason why you see the striations, is because you have a bunch of thick filaments and then only thin, and then a bunch of thick filaments and then only thin, and that's what causes the striations, which is why the striations are perpendicular to the muscle fiber. It's like this, and then it's like this, and then it's like this. So that's how you get your striations. Now, you might wonder, right, what about right here, right? What about this part of your A-band where you have both, right, you have both thick and thin filaments? Isn't that going to be a kind of a darker region? You got both thick and thin. Is it darker? Yes. Now, what about right here? So this is the really dark part, thick and thin together. What about here? where it's in the A-band, but it only has thin filaments. Is that going to be lighter or darker than this part? It's going to be lighter, right? Another German word. H-zone is because the German word for brighter starts with an H, okay? The word is heller, so it starts with an H. So that slightly lighter portion is called the H-zone, or H-band, however you want to say it, okay? So these are your different bands that show up when you actually look at the muscle cell under a microscope, right? Now, what we're going to have is the triads are really important because, okay, what you should notice is, in this illustration, this is an M line right here, okay? That's an M line right there. So coming off of the M line, what's this? It's coming off the M line, so what is that? That's a thin filament. And then, what's this right here? That's a Z-line. So coming off of the Z-line, what do you have? You have a thin filament coming out like this. Whoops, I just messed that up. Thin filament, thick filament, right? So what's happening to the thick and thin filaments right there? They're overlapping. That's called the zone of overlap. There's actually a name for it, zone of overlap. Now. What do you notice lined up with the zone of overlap? A triad. That's exactly right. The triads for skeletal muscle line up with the zone of overlap. And this is really important. You have to understand this. And the reason why you have to understand it is because the way that muscles contract, okay? The way that the muscles contract is the myosin head is actually in this kind of like set position, right? And what it wants to do is this myosin head right here wants to contact what's called the active site on the thin filament, on the actin, okay? It wants to contact it. Now, if the myosin head contacts the actin and it forms a connection, what's that called? There's a name for that. When it actually comes across and makes the connection, myosin head attaches to actin. It's called a cross bridge. Now, if you form the cross bridge, this myosin head will then rock backwards and it'll drag towards the M line, like this, okay? So if that happens, if you can actually form a cross bridge, you're gonna take these actin filaments and you're gonna drag them towards the M line, like that. So if you drag the actin filaments towards the M line, what is gonna happen to your H zone? What happens to your H zone? It gets smaller and smaller because the actin, right, is getting closer and closer to the M line, right? Now, that is basically the way it works, is you take a myosin head, you grab, make the cross bridge, go like this, and then do it again, and again, and again. And what that does is that drags your Z lines closer to the M line. And that's a muscle contraction, is your filaments are basically sliding past each other. Okay? And the reason why this works is because you have a zone of overlap. Now, in order to make this work with the zone of overlap, 
you have to release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, where did we say the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the most concentrated? In the terminal cistern. Where are the triads with their terminal cisterns uh, lined up? They're associated with what? What are they associated with? The zone of overlap. When the action potential reaches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, what happens to the calcium that's in the terminal cistern? It gets released. And then what does the calcium do? So what happens is the calcium is released into the cytosol of this muscle cell, of this myocyte, where it then binds to what? Troponin. It binds to troponin. Now remember, troponin was attached to tropomyosin, which is wrapped around the actin filaments. And what that was doing was blocking your active sites. Once the calcium binds to troponin, it changes the conformation, right? Like you said, changes the conformation, which exposes the active site. So tropomyosin moves out of the way. The active sites are now exposed. Myosin can bind and then it can move the actin closer to the Z-line. And as long as you have calcium available, it'll just keep binding and moving, binding and moving. And that's what's gonna happen. And so you're just gonna keep your muscle contracted like that, okay? Now, what happens when you remove the calcium, when you re-uptake the calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? What happens? The active sites are covered again. So if the active sites are covered again, can you contract the muscle? No, nope. so then the muscle relaxes. So all you gotta do is clear calcium out of the cytosol, put it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and when that happens, now your muscle is relaxed, okay? Now, this is an important uh, concept, is does it take energy for the myosin head to rock backwards towards the M line? So it forms a cross bridge and then it rocks backwards. So they go like this, does that take energy? Nope, does not take any energy to do that. What about resetting the myosin head? That's what takes energy, okay? So, right, as long as you have ATP available, you're gonna be able to reset the heads, and then you can do it again, and then reset, do it again, and then reset, okay? If you're dead, and you don't have ATP being produced anymore, once you get rid of all of your ATP, and you don't produce anymore because you're dead, right, your sarcoplasmic reticulum is gonna deteriorate, it's gonna release calcium into your muscle cells, and what's gonna happen when you release that calcium? When you release the calcium from your sarcoplasmic reticulum, what happens? You're gonna contract, right? And then after you contract, you used up all your ATP, you're dead, you're not making any more, so what happens to the contraction? It stays, and what do you call that? That's rigor mortis. It's because you're dead and you're not producing any more ATP, okay? Now, this is an important concept, length tension relationships. In order for this to work properly, you have to form these cross bridges, right? And the better the cross bridges are in contact with each other, the more efficiently you can contract. So when you look, right, and you have Decreased length down here, because this is zero length, right? And you have decreased length down here, right? That means that the muscle, uh, like essentially like the myofibril, is really, really kind of compressed, right? So it's like as short as possible. But what happens is, when they're really short, your actin and your myosin don't line up properly. Because it's kind of like, it's like this. It's like this, and instead of lining up straight, it goes like this, and then it, it kind of like kinks it, and it knocks it offline. So instead of being straight like this, your fibers are like all in weird like this. They're not in proper orientation with each other. So if they're not properly oriented, can you form good cross bridges? No. So the bottom down here, this is not very much strength, okay? So you cannot produce a strong contraction if your filaments are not lined up properly. Now on the opposite end, if you look like this, whoops. If you look like that, how much overlap do you have right here? None. 
This is if you stretch the muscle too far and now your filaments are not overlapping at all. So how much strength can you have in your contraction? None. That's when you're totally no more overlap. Ideally, you have a really good zone of overlap right here. That's the sort of middle relaxed length for your muscle. So at that point, that's when you can develop the best cross bridges and the greatest strength of contraction. Okay? So as long as the things are lined up properly, you get a much stronger contraction. So this is your length tension curve. All right? Now, last couple things. Cranial uh, cardiac muscle. Right? Something you absolutely have to understand about cardiac muscle is they're pretty much the same. Right? Except that they are uninucleate. Right? Uh, and then the other thing is their shape is very, very different. Okay? Their shape is different because they actually are not just long cylinders. They kind of branch out. Okay? Now, in addition to that, their sarcoplasmic reticulum, what's weird about their sarcoplasmic reticulum? There's something strange about it. It's very different from skeletal muscle. No? Do they have sarcoplasmic reticulum? Yeah. Yeah, they do. What's weird about it? Something strange about it. Do they have triads? No. No, they don't have triads. They'll still have terminal cisterns, but their sarcoplasmic reticulum does not line up with T tubules to form triads. And it does not line up with the zone of overlap. All right, does not line up with the zone of overlap, okay? Now, what's an intercalated disc and what's its point, what's its purpose? Gap junctions. You're gonna have gap junctions associated with intercalated discs because for your cardiac muscle, you want the signal to travel from one cell directly to the next cell to the next cell so you can coordinate your contractions. So it's one smooth contraction going across the entire organ, okay? Now, the last little thing, right? So this is the kind of branching pattern that you see. This is the intercalated disc right here, right? Okay? Here's an intercalated disc right here, and it's a branching pattern. It's branching out like this, okay? But the last thing is this, automaticity or autorhythmicity. What does that mean? So they do not need nervous innervation to do what? Contract. To generate a contraction, okay? The heart can actually generate its own contraction signal, okay? Now, the way that this works is you have specialized cells, they're called the conducting system, and it includes sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, and what are called conducting cells, okay? Now, what they do, and this is the last little part right here, is uh, I'm actually focusing on sodium because it's the, the thing that you guys are the most used to, okay? Technically, it's actually calcium, but I want you to focus on sodium, okay? So what we're gonna uh, kind of focus on is the cells of the conducting system are actually leaky, so they have a lot more leak channels, and that allows sodium, or essentially a positively charged ion, to slowly enter the cell. And when it slowly enters the cell, what happens to the resting membrane potential? It starts to rise until it reaches threshold on its own. So when it reaches threshold on its own, what happens? You generate, you cause a depolarization, and you spontaneously generate an action potential. So the heart can cause its own action potentials. What do sympathetic and parasympathetic do to that heartbeat? They change the rate of it. So parasympathetic does what? Decreases it. Sympathetic? Increases it. But they do not generate the heartbeat. Okay, so that's what's going to be on your exam uh, on Wednesday. Uh, tomorrow we will do like muscle innervations and all that kind of stuff. So no smooth muscle. We didn't talk about smooth muscle, so don't worry about smooth muscle.